in from rainy Pittsburgh. Jamie's got a topic for us. It's awesome. Keep those topics coming. Jason, hi, Ben. Hi, Tony from Southampton. Francine, oh, my God, yes, back in the day, LOL, we would have so many stories and really should write a book about all oh, yeah. the crazy things that went down there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Francine, throw, throw something out there. Throw me a crazy story in the comments. Oh, What's one of the that, craziest things that people don't know about corporate me? housing? Uh, no, oh, no, Fra Francine, uh, trust you. I mean, yeah, yeah, Francine, you tell it because there's way too many stories that we could all get in trouble. We just thank God there was no phones back then. <laughs> to take pictures and post. Uh, no. Well, I mean, there were phones. It wasn't that long. But there, yeah, no, no smartphones, no. right? No camera phones. No high, high I, yeah. res. But, but we, weren't, so we weren't cool. passing pictures of our parties and our wild events and just, there was no there might have been a Polaroid, a Polaroid or two floating around. Oh, yeah. A little, there was no, those there, little wide up joints. There was yeah. nothing better than the Oakwood days. And then when we, I mean, when we first went to ERC, I mean, it was so small. It was tiny. There was barely anybody there, but we had the best parties in the world. Um, you know what? It, this this industry has just been so amazing. And I've been very blessed for getting to be part of the ride. I mean, selling nationally at first, selling at RMCs. Um, then I was blessed enough to go over and been tapped on the shoulder to open up the international division. And that was the dream of a lifetime. And I, I've worked with some amazing people across the country that have just, and worldwide, that have just been uh, just amazing people. And yeah. it's, it's been a fun ride. Well, you know, it's been a fun ride. Yeah, yeah, seriously. I mean, the people are amazing. Let me ask you this. Let me go back a couple, a couple of beats here, right? I'm going to ask you a question I ask, like when I do corporate housing conversations, right? Okay. What is the difference between corporate housing, temp housing, Temporary accommodations. I mean, temp living. There's all these different names. Is there a differentiation? I'm still trying to understand this. No, I, I think corporate housing, like, again, it was the, the, the first one on board in a sense that there is a little bit of a difference, but I think most the corporate housing companies are evolving. So when I say that, when you first started with corporate housing, it was apartments and only apartments, and that was it. We Somebody walked in, furnished the apartments, boom, you were done. You had managers in every area furnishing it, setting everything up, selling it. And then what's happened and evolved over the time, over the times is that clients are looking and they're like starting to, you know, the Airbnbs come out in the world, the extended stays. So the corporate housing companies, you know, that are truly just corporate housing companies and they're, they're all great, but they're doing setting up their own furnished apartments. But what's happening is, is everybody's realizing their clients are saying, well, we, sometimes we need more. Sometimes we need a hotel. You know, mm -hmm. for a few days, maybe because we can't do a one month stay or maybe that apartment's not ready to go. So they're asking for hotels. Now I've got clients that are asking for homes. So, you know, then you've got it's not just corporate. You've got student housing. You've got intern housing. You've got government. So people have changed the name from corporate housing to temporary accommodation. Oh, alternative I accommodation. see. Because so temp housing yeah. has a broader temp housing has a broader application, right? And now I mean, and and I know you've done a ton with insurance, you yeah. know, for instance, and you know, you know, oh yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. We got Jack Jampel checking in. Hi from Philly. Hi, like a couple of comments. It's awesome. Shane Burlinson. Hi Shane. Hi Tony. Look at this. Quirks checking in. This is great. Janet Turner checking in from the Poconos. Janet, what's for dinner? <laughs> Let me know. Um, we've got a couple. We've got a couple. Uh, uh, we've got a couple of topics here. Okay. And yeah. Jamie, Jamie's throwing out one here. Okay. And I apologize that I'm not getting all the comments loaded in. It looks like they're coming in on a, on a severe delay here. Let's see. Here. Okay. Boom. Phil, Phil's got one. Let's start with Phil's comment. Tony, how has the insurance sales approach changed in the last five years? Okay. Well, it's changed. I mean, over the last five years, I think that what you've seen over the, the last five years is that more and more two things you're seeing two things. We're going to go with the way that it's procured is you're seeing more and more of the carriers making the decision from the top down more than they ever have in the past of who is going to be the providers. So back in the days, the adjusters could just really do whatever the heck they wanted, right? Just pick somebody you like and 
they'll provide the the temp housing and the, the housing for their um, insureds that are their policyholders. Well, now these companies are like, I mean, the state farms, the all states, even the smaller companies, the Plymouth, you know, all these other companies, they're pushing back and they're saying, no, we want consistency. We want it streamlined. If we see invoices, we're just pushing them back at you and you're not going to get it approved. So now they've taken more of a control. When they're saying not get it approved, when you're saying not get it approved, I just want to understand. Does that mean they're just not going to pay the bill? Well, they say they're not going to pay the bill, but what they do is that person gets home, that that adjuster will, you know, I've heard of adjusters getting written up on it. I mean, that's, that's how extreme it's gotten. So they do, they push back on the invoices and they push back on, you know, just making sure that their suppliers have been vetted. They've, you know, they're negotiating. Oh my goodness, Phil, you know this, in in the insurance housing right now, the carriers are just, you know, pushing back on pricing, um, service fees, you know, all of the delivery. Uh, The insurance companies have definitely become, you know, more savvy at it. Before, again, they let their policyholders just go pick anybody also. And they're trying now to just, you know, pick companies that have a reputation, that, you know, have quality product. Because think of this, the, the, um, you know, you're displaced from your home and it's horrific and you do not know what to do. So you, right. you know, you call your carrier like, OK, what does my policy mean? Do most people don't even know what their policy says. It's called an ALE policy. And so the carriers are saying, OK, stay calm. I'm here for you. I'm taking care of you. Here's a couple of companies for you to go to. And they push it out this way. The adjusters are familiar with those companies and they're hand holding. You know, they're they trust that insurance housing company to handhold everything. Um, you're still seeing, so you're seeing more and more of uh, there be big insurance housing companies and you're seeing where the corporate housing companies are providing when a client wants furnished apartments are providing furnished apartments to these insurance housing companies. But here's a big, but, but it's hard for the local uh, smaller and corporate housing companies to get involved because they have to be able to, you know, hotels is the number one business for insurance, for insurance housing companies. Right. There's right. hundreds of hotels. I mean, like hundreds of hotels right. a night. Right. And they're everywhere compared to like, you know, they're being kind of corporate housing yeah. or temp living and yeah. or metro area. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's really, you know, so that's interesting. So are, are you seeing this, are the same kind, really curious here, are the same companies that are big in corporate housing that we know from a relocation standpoint and global mobility standpoint? Are these the same players in the insurance housing space or are they different? No. So you you have you have corporate housing companies that might work at a very regional level, very local regional level. Um, but the top insurance housing companies, the top four are not at all affiliated with the corporate housing companies. The only corporate housing company that really stands out probably that goes in for rfps and things like that that are corporate housing related is national um Mm -hmm. national corporate housing they they do do insurance they have a whole separate insurance housing division um you know i started oakwoods oakwood that's how i started it right after i did international i started oakwoods insurance housing and that was fun um you know but again the mindset going from corporate housing because you're pushing your furniture, you're pushing your own inventory back in the day to insurance housing, you have you have homes, you're setting up homes. I mean, you're setting up, mm-hmm. you know, mobile homes, hotels, everything. So you definitely have a different type of um, business model. So it's not a natural. Really interesting. It's a very So it's not model. really the corporate apartment that we're used to. No. It's, it could be. A mobile home. I mean, imagine putting a corporate transferee in a mobile home. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, maybe all. if they're like a mining company or something, but like generally like a man camp, you know, kind of thing. But like, I don't. Well, and, yeah. and the, the other thing that's pretty common is, again, if you think of the, you know, the devastations, corporate housing only has like a 30, 60 day window for the corporate housing, um, maybe 90 but you can get homes if you negotiate, you can get homes. And so people would much rather, they, they get like kind of quality. So that means if you have a house that's, you know, 3000 square feet, you're getting that 3000 square foot home. And the interesting thing, here's the interesting thing about- Like, kind and quality. That's so interesting. Uh, like, kind and quality. 
you all better know about like kind of quality if anything ever happens to yeah. your house that or call me because <laughs> i'll tell you yeah, what call it tony if something ever happens here but imagine that in a corporate policy and a corporate relocation policy where the temp living policy wasn't amount of rooms or but it was like kind of quality yeah. i mean anyway mind-blowing but okay go mind ahead blowing. no mind-blowing but no so that's that's the big difference and the thing with corporate housing which i love it's like one of my things with corporate housing um for the people that set up corporate housing you've got somebody in there you know you've got phil you know, his whole team um, at interim um, homes, you have them walking in, looking at the apartment, making sure everything's perfect. I mean, that's like, right. I, I love that. You know, everything looks beautiful. And that's why corporate housing and temporary temporary housing companies, they we all network with each other's corporate housing companies because we know the expectations that are set up. We know the perfection that goes into it. With insurance housing, and, and this not, the, in insurance housing, you find a home, you have them take pictures of it. You're not walking yourself through it and making sure everything's beautiful. And then you're hoping that your partners, which are very good, your furniture partners are, you know, you send over the courts and the, you know, fashion furniture and everybody, you send them out there and you're saying, please make sure you look and make sure it looks good. But for quality control, it's not as tight as corporate housing. And, and it's no disrespect for anybody in the insurance housing division, because I've been doing it forever, but there's, so you get like kind and quality so you might have more kind of maybe upside when you're talking about a three thousand square foot home right but to your point you know i imagine they're not playing for the same repeatability factor the same repeat business i mean no. your house doesn't burn down every year and you're right. back you know back in it and you know you're gonna be shopping your, yeah really uh, right geez, knock on wood um yeah. no that makes a lot of sense this, this is great let's see we got some comments coming in here as well we got lizzie beats coming in beats from shy town in the house beats, beats. and then we got richard majewski been in this service apartment sector for 25 years in the uk and i'm just blown away by these insights thank you amazing love the sector love you richard you're oh, awesome thank you richard <laughs> big shout out to richard and his, his saba wine wine time and blue room all those great stuff he's doing elena anderson hey tony ben greeting from maryland loving the convo already what's up that's great hello yeah, this is great. Let's see here. What else we've got? Mike Quigley from Silicon Valley. What's up, Quigley? Jamie threw us a topic as well. Let's find it here. Jamie threw us a topic, lack of inventory. Oh. Can we talk about lack of inventory? Tony, what's going on out there? Uh, well, it's not good. Uh, the lack of <laughs> inventory, not good. The lack of inventory has been really challenging. It's... Um, it's been putting in obviously an interruption in corporate housing. It's, it's, you know, I've got a group of people that I'm looking for right now in Irvine. And I mean, you know, you're begging you're, I mean, I'm going through MLS, I'm going through corporate housing companies. I'm going through, you know, you know, people that I know all over the, the, the area. And it's just so hard to get the, the inventory. It's been impossible. You have to be really creative and, you know let's get so i want to get specific for a moment because i want people to really understand what's happening out there so you're 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 working on this group in irvine let's say right what is the hard part about it specifically what's the biggest challenge i i mean the biggest challenge right now is the inventory because i've i've really have i've contacted you know various um corporate housing companies uh various direct apartment communities um in real estate people to try and get homes and the 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 inventory is just so tight because i mean in the california market and don't uh, i think it's about four percent um uh 90 96 percent uh no four percent vacancy rate which is unheard of and it's across the you know across the country new york new jersey i mean you know people that would get into homes right away i mean with like for example in the insurance industry and and the same thing i know with corporate housing but in the insurance industry when somebody gets displaced from their homes they need to be moved in right away and in the past it was no big deal we were able to get people in you know within seven days now you're looking at i mean you're looking at two three four weeks sometimes even five weeks and so is the hardest part the move-in date that's the hardest criteria or is it the number of rooms it's, or it's, it's the, the length of stay what is what's 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 the deal breaker well, for inventory, it's really finding it. It's, it's for it to be out there because what's happening is I'm talking to different um, companies now and they, they, these like communities, apartment communities, you know, 
rentals, uh, real estate, when you're renting homes, they used to be very flexible on doing shorter terms. Sure. So like if you went to a par uh, apartment community down the street and mm -hmm. you had a relationship with them for years and you're like, okay, I need three months. I'll pay you an extra couple hundred dollars a month. They're looking right. at you now and going, no, I don't need that because I can now, I, I'm so, I am, I have such limited inventory right now. I don't need to jump through hoops with you anymore. And so they're not jumping through hoops as much. These so they're not doing the short term rentals. Not as much as they used to now. I mean, it's just a lot harder to get. Even with a even with a several hundred to your point, even with a seven hundred dollar premium, let's let's well, call maybe that seven hundred. <laughs> I mean, I'm no, no, I'm sorry, I said I meant to say several hundred. No, but well, well, I mean, you know, what does that represent? A fifteen percent, um, yeah. you know, premium I mean, maybe on the unit. Yeah, I mean, you can't. I mean, you still can ask for the for the premiums, but it's just not as easy um, because you know they they're they're there's just not much to be had. And they've got waiting lists. And I, and I can tell you for the home rentals, the difference is, is the landlords are still a little gun shy on it. And the premium, I mean, they're, you know, they're looking for a pretty high premium. Um, you know, the good thing about insurance companies, they're, they're willing to pay it a lot. But with the corporate housing and the student housing and all that, you can only go so high before everybody says, you know, this is just, this is crazy how how high this rate is which population of customers is going to be the first to lose or the most impacted by this do you think with this i mean i think that i i, I do think that the, the the corporates when they start coming you know really full force the ones that are relocating mm -hmm. uh, not so much the ones not the not the you know projects project teams because those are longer stays but i think the shorter stays are going to be harder i think we're going to now see in more remote areas, not so much remote, but secondary markets, you're going to find it harder to be able to get the inventory. Um, well, you know, so I think that's going to be pretty hard. Like, like, do you think like, like, you know, when I think about, you know, you're talking about insurance, you know, insurance customers who've been displaced, you're talking about corporate clients, you're talking about projects. What about interns? I mean, they're oh, well, really in low man on the totem pole, right? Right. Interns are having problems. So I'm working with some students right now. Um, I, I've been coordinating for some of the, some of the universities. I'm coordinating some of their their moves for their people that are coming in overseas. And so the problem, and you're and you're right, you hit it, you hit it. The problem is that basically they their price point. It's really their price point because the rents have gone up so astronomically. It's their price point. So the the ones on ten week uh, assignments are having a pretty difficult time. There are ones that are in six month and year leases, but you got to, you have to become creative. So, you know, you're, you're pushing out to the corporate housing companies and saying, okay, this is a year lease. Where are we going to go? What are you going to do for me on a year lease versus, you know, a 10 week program. So you kind of a push back to everybody saying, go back yeah, and do your numbers because the, the, they this, can't afford is this, it. Is this more of an economics issue though? I wonder, I mean, I, I'm kind of a fan of, of economics, like in, in markets, right. And basically saying, you know, if you throw enough money at a problem, maybe you can, you can solve it. But the question is, what is the, the, the amount of money that needs to be thrown in? You know, we were talking before about enticing the, the landlords with, you know, maybe 10% premiums in the past to do a three month lease. Right. What is that premium you think? What is the market rate right now for that premium? I mean, depending on the, price? depending on the market, I mean, I, I really don't see, you know, for a lot of these month to month type, these homes, well, home, homes typically, three months no people aren't going to take three or four months less than that so they're I just think not gonna they're just not gonna do it even if you offered them 150 percent of what they were no asking. no i no okay okay so they're not but they're i mean on a whole they don't on a whole they don't sit there and say i'm gonna give it yeah if you say i'm gonna pay your whole 12 months up front they're gonna go okay or they're gonna say you're gonna pay seven months or nine months so what they're looking for they're not looking for the month to month they're looking unless they're like you know unless that's what their business is there's so many investment properties out there that are furnished. So I'm, I'm talking two different things. You're talking furnished houses or ones that you have to furnish. The ones you have to furnish, you're looking at probably, I mean, you could look to a five to $700 premium a month yeah. on those kind of homes. But and and what does that represent know, as a percentage of the, of the, of the rent asked rent? Is that like well, $500 on 2000 or is that $500 on 5,000? Yeah, I guess I'm trying to understand, is it 10%, 20%, 30%? 30 what do we think like, that upcharge is? at between 10 and 15 percent uh, on okay. some markets okay. and the more in the higher demand markets that you're looking at like the super you know tight impacted 
I, I'm I'm probably getting guessing they can get at least twenty percent. Wow, that's incredible. Let me uh, let's see here. We got some comments coming in and stuff, and and I'm trying to manage the comments here on my phone. I've got them coming in over here. We got people. Oh, this is great. Okay, thanks for all these comments. This is great. We got Jill Parteka. Hello, Deluxe. What's up, Jilly? We've got Marcello here from Atlanta in the house, checking in. Hashtag Team Live. I love that hashtag. <laughs> Didn't know it was a thing, but I love it. It is now. Let's see. Let's go in order here, Jamie. Let's see what Jamie says. With high occupancy, management companies can set new leases and standards. No more three month, only yep. 12 to 14 yep. months. Increase in pet friendly requests versus pet friendly properties. Ooh, okay. Request shifting to more bedrooms for space, making the inventory for two and three bedrooms scarce. Yep. That's it. That's it, Jamie. Mm -hmm. You got it. I mean, that's, that's what you're seeing. So are we seeing that the that are we seeing rate hikes commensurate with the demand? Are we seeing the three bedrooms just get just totally priced out or well, just not wanting to do business at all or just not available at all? Well, I mean, three bedrooms have always, I mean, always been difficult to get to get because for apart I mean, and again I'm going to apartments because with apartments, not as many buildings out there have three bedrooms, it, you know, because most families at that point are getting a house or doing whatever. So you don't have as many communities with a, uh, three bedrooms. So you're going to find a lot less flexibility on lowering the rate on a three bedroom than you will maybe on a one or two bedroom. So yeah, so the three bedrooms are scarce. They're just really hard to get, hard to grab onto. One, because they're really limited you don't have that many three bedrooms when you have a whole building 400 units. I mean, your your units of apartments. It's very narrow how many three bedrooms you have. Um, and then you're seeing the um, they're, they're rarely ever come available. And so you're paying a lot of money when you do want them. When you want the two and three bedrooms, you're, you're paying a lot more. Let, money me, so. let, let me ask you, since you do have experience working, you know, with the you know, with the property management company kind of at the property level, do you see more three bedrooms being constructed in the future to meet well, this demand is this go ahead i i do i do see that coming more i know in my neighborhood um you know they we really didn't have that many apartment complexes in, in you know where i live and the ones that are being built right now are there are more three bedrooms because well i mean i guess the affordability right now to buy homes even though the prices are going up in homes interest rates are still low so if you do the projection over you know five ten years you see that it actually makes sense to buy right now versus not buying. However, a lot of the people don't have that kind of down payment. So they are renting the three bedrooms. More families are renting as so. I, so, yeah, the answer to you is yes, I do see more three bedrooms. Again, the building of the, the property that just came up in my area, there were a lot more three bedrooms than I imagined. And they're beautiful. Yeah. Like, I'll move in. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get yeah. out of my house and I, spend I, taking care of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially if, and, and I know there's been a lot of debate on this, like will millennials move to the suburbs once they finally, you know, get married, have kids, do the whole thing, right? Will they actually, and if they don't, then they'll definitely be needing those three bedrooms for sure. Let's see, Amy says, hi, Tony. Yes, three hi. bedrooms have always been a challenge in our industry. Miss you, my friend. Miss you That's too, Amy. How Amy sounds. Uh, let's see here. Jill, no flexibility in lease terms. Apartments are full. They don't need us. Nope. Jill, everybody needs you, Jill. I wish they needed us, Jill, but they don't. <laughs> not Isn't a, that not funny? I mean, don't you one day don't you one day feel like their best customer and then the next day feel like persona non grata? Pretty much, yes, yes. I mean, you know, we we love our partners at the com apartment communities, but right now we're like <gasps> really you can't just squeeze us in come on you know we'll yeah. always be you know because we're i'm like well we're repeat business we're always gonna have business for you good times and bad times yeah. so come and what on, do they say to, what do they say to that tony what do they say to that what do they you say know, to some, that? some of them are i will be honest there are some great ones out there that are going okay let me see if i can do anything and then there's ones that are like but you know what we just have don't have it to give you <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes I bet sometimes they say too, like, yeah, you're repeat business and you're gonna come back and always ask for it at a discount, always ask for extra, extra right. this and that and extra terms and and it's like, you know, because and, and I'm just I'm saying that also from a you know background in in, in in household goods, which is going through a very similar 
right. you know, supply chain shortage, right? Right now, an availability shortage. And, and and you're right, the corporate client is getting squeezed. When when there's a ton of consumer demand out there for these same apartments and they can, you know, raise the rates to whatever they need to be to the market rate. And there's other uh, buyers out there, like in the case of corporate housing, that's that's insurance buyers in the case mm -hmm. of you know, moving services, that's, uh, that's, that's military and government clients, you know, and they pay just a lot more and the, yeah. the, the corporate folks get squeezed. And for years, they've always been the best client. The corporate clients always been, Oh, I'm the corporate client, but unfortunately they seem to be second or third in the pecking order these days for limited supply. And, uh, right. And that's a difficult conversation to have with our value corporate partners. Right. I mean, if you think about this, so let's let's look at corporate housing. Let's look at insurance housing, right? You're looking at the two of them, and God forbid, because I've been through many disasters, not only affected me and my family, but so sorry. just just the world, you know. Um, so, if you have a big, and and I, I'm not going to say LA because I live too close for me, but let's say you have something happening in, let's say, I'm not going to, let's say Oklahoma City, God forbid. So you have another major disaster. You have an earthquake because they had one a few couple of years ago, right? They have They do have them, even though people think only California gets earthquakes, which obviously we don't. We know that because of Haiti. Yeah, another sad, very sad um, thing that's going on right now. Horrible. Hey, bummer. You're you're really you're kind of a buzzkill, Tony. You're talking about but, all yeah. the earthquakes everywhere. Yeah. But but what I'm saying is, so <laughs> so your corporate. So let's just say this. Okay, think of it this way. You're a corporation, and you're about to relocate people into Oklahoma City, but in the meantime, God forbid, a disaster just happened or happened a few months before, or you know, about to happen, you're gonna find that's gonna happen is a lot of those insurance people that if there was even any, any inventory out there, which there again, there's no inventory in the world right now, they would probably get some priority because they need, they're gonna be longer stays. You know, they're gonna be longer stays. So if you are even a corporate housing company, you're a corporate housing house company and you know you've got somebody that's coming in for 12 months, six months, whatever, and then you've got somebody coming in 30 to 90 days, which one are you going to pick? Your landlord, which one are you going to pick? You're going to pick the one that's going to be longer. Yeah, and longer so you don't term. Have to do as much. The longer term, unless yep. for some reason you felt like you could raise rates again in six months or three right. months, right? Because right. the cycle's just going up that much. I mean, I thought about, I'm in a rental house right now and I'm in one year and I, my, my lease expires in February. I'm thinking about renegotiating for that second year just because I know as much as I'm spending right now, they could probably re relet that house for five hundred dollars more right. than I'm getting it for right now, right. and I don't want them to even think about going to market and finding that out. So I right. might just relet it now. Well, if it's a smart landlord, they won't do that because it's better to keep somebody in house for a long time that pays, cleans, and they're not that, that smart. Tony, <laughs> they're not that smart. Okay. I always tell Keep people this. don't raise your rents astronomically if you've got great. Brenda, you just well, it. it's always the it's always the trade off of how much does it cost me to move versus how right. much is my new rate going to be. Speaking right. of moving, Brandy Thorns checking in from Airs. What's up, Brandy? Yes, household goods is absolutely Ben. She's yeah for sure. Robert Brazuela, do it, Ben Cross, before they get you right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I know, Robert. I know, right? <laughs> Jocelyn, Tony, miss your face, Mr. Jocelyn. <laughs> I face. love you. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm literally going to read anything anybody writes, so you can feel free to just go crazy, y'all. Um, this best. is great. Is she? That's yeah. awesome. Let's see here. Uh, we'll get some good feedback here. Actually, um, I'll, yeah, this is good. This is good stuff here. Amy, Amy, actually, thank you, Amy. I needed that. Um, <laughs> she loves my, Amy loves my Amy impression. Thank you, Amy. Very cool. Uh, let's see. We got a couple more questions here. Speaking of Robert, Robert says, "So Tony, so Tony, I'm going to read this. I'll like, pretend Robert's going to read this. Okay. So Tony and Dell, is it time now to tap into the entire STR industry to get the inventory we all need? Short term rental. Tap into the industry. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, we, the we, entire. We, I think what he's inferring I mean, here is there's <laughs> aspects that are untapped. There's alternatives, perhaps, if you will. Right." Right. And, and there are, and that's, that, and that's, yeah, Robert. So yes, the, it's time to look at all alternatives for the industry, for the short-term rentals and really to, you know, be able to go in and negotiate with some of these, you know, you, the interesting thing is, you know, you've got some of these homes that are out there that are furnished and they're looking more to do the shorter, shorter stays because they're making a lot of money on those nightly stays. Right. 
So now you've got a happy medium. Now you've got to kind of go in there and go, okay, well, we're going to give you money, but we're going to give you long term. So there's so many different ways to have to go out now and negotiate. And, you know, you go in and you negotiate some of these short term nightly stay people and say, you know what, you can do the nightly stays, but let me tell you why it's better to do the longer term, you know, the wear and tear on your place, the, you know, the, the turnover, your neighbor's getting angry. Um, even with apartment complexes, you know, you can just go back in and renegotiate. You know what, even the hotels, you know what I know, you know, people don't really want to be in hotels, but right now it's time to negotiate with the hotels and get those rates down so that then it's for the, you know, for the corporate housing companies to get them down as well. Um, and then when I say that, it's not to put people into hotels. We don't want that to happen. Well, but it, it does but seem like hotel prices are going down at the right. same time that corporate apartments going up. Right. But you have to have, because the inventory is so tight right now with the corporate housing, that as a corporate housing provider, you have to, you have an obligation to say, hey, you know, Mr. Corporate, Mrs. Corporate, we're going to make sure that your employees, when they come, they have somewhere to stay. I got this great price here at, you know, the residence in. We're going to put them in the residence in for a few days, for two weeks, because my apartment's not going to be ready now for two, three weeks, and then swift them right on over to that apartment. So the creativity has to come out even more so now. Well, let's talk about creativity and let's address the, the ele elephant that never leaves the room. You like Which that one? dramatic tease? Which one? <laughs> Richard says, will insurance companies turn to dun, 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 Airbnb as That's a result good. of lack of inventory? That is a good question, Richard. It is great, great, great question, Richard. That is a good question. So with the answer to that is yes, they're starting to do it somewhat, but here's where I don't see it happening right away. And as much because there's a, the, they're going to still use the insurance housing companies to help them negotiate with the Airbnbs out there if they are going to use Airbnbs. And the reason for that, as we all talk about in this industry, it's because we manage, we manage it. We manage the experience. We don't just, it's not just a place to live. It's the managing of the experience. Well, we also float the AR as yep. well. Yep. Right. I mean, so, they get, we, right. have, we, we extend terms. I don't know the Airbnbs extending. No, terms, no, they no they're, they're extending terms. We're doing the billing. We're, we're, we're handling everything. So, yes, Air, you know, right now, the insurance housing companies will look at the Airbnb, Airbnbs as last resort. Well, insurance companies, what I'm hearing right now is they're not ready to go that path because they need just um, they, they need the total package, the total control, all of that. So um, they're, I, I do not foresee them right away saying, go ahead, just go find that Airbnb out there. Um, now, if, they're, if their person finds the Airbnb, they're not going to tell them they can't rent there. They're going to say, fine, rent it, but have, you know, so-and-so insurance housing company handle it for you. Or are they going to do a reimbursement? They do. They do. So, so there are... There are a lot of there are people that are policyholders that will do lump sum reimbursements or they'll turn in the receipts. They'll do all that. To be honest with you, I'll tell you something interesting when you're talking please. to adjusters. They're like, oh, please don't make them do that for me because the adjusters really don't want to have to look at receipts. They they don't want to look at receipts. They want somebody else to do it for them. So, yes, something happens to me, God forbid. I can go rent my Airbnb Airbnb because I'm, you know, I'm probably gonna set my own apartment up, obviously house up. But you know, I, I better I hear, otherwise. I hear, I hear, uh, <laughs> out but, there. but I mean, you know, they the Airbnb, the adjusters are gonna try try their best to either A discourage that or B, if they do do it, have it managed through an insurance housing company. Um, but yeah, people are doing it. I mean, when I, I'm in Ventura and we had the Thomas fire, um, and wiped out over 100, 200 homes in my community. Um, yeah, I mean, people didn't, I mean, you, there weren't enough corporate apartments or furnished homes or anything in the area. We know we're not a corporate America city, we're a beach town. And sure enough, the vacation rentals and the Airbnbs, they did exactly that. Yeah, Jeff's saying many times the insurers go to Airbnb before housing is even set up, reducing the control of the insurance housing companies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 I mean, that's do. true, right? I mean, if, you're, if your house is being flooded, like flood water's coming in, and at this point you realize, hey, you know, roll up your pants, it's too late to save your shoes, 
and then you're just you're just on the on the Google, right? Like, hey, where can right. we go tonight? We need to go somewhere tonight. Yeah, I mean the, the yeah, I mean the hotels all the time. You you don't get to the um, the policyholders, the insurance, the people that have been displaced until after they're in a hotel one or two nights. Absolutely, and you're right. They're already looking. They're looking in their neighborhood. You know, you're helping them. It's different. Um, I, I got you know. So you're they're doing all that. I mean, but on a whole, on the majority of it, they have not found a house yet. You know, a lot of the majority of the big portion of it hasn't found a house yet. But you know, all I can tell all of you out there is you better have your emergency plan ready to go. It, it, I will tell you how many people I have seen that have not and that I know that don't even have their know where their paperwork is, their, you know, insurance papers. Forget that because you get online, but your passports, all your important documents that you need. That if you were going to run out of your house tonight and you got 20 minutes to pack right you better know your where house you're... is on fire right now yeah well if your house is on fire know where your purse is i am telling you right now if your house is on fire those of you that know have wallets and your purse know where it is before you go to bed i know that sounds so little know where your purse is know where your wallet is know where your cell phone is so that you can grab it so that you can pay and call people and I have spoken to people that have been displaced. I've been on the phone with these people crying. It's it's horrible, but they don't even have a wallet. They okay. have no money. I and would so, feel so helpless. Yeah, I mean, I can give you a list of things you need to do. That's just it, the things that you have to do, but that, have shoes under your bed, okay? Do you have shoes under your bed, Ben? I got a lot of stuff under my bed. I don't know if I got any shoes. <laughs> do you have them next to your bed? Okay. They probably, don't, they probably don't match. Yeah, make sure your clothes are nearby in case you aren't wearing clothes. Would you like no right? That's like my worst fear is like okay. being out in the street naked, looking at my house burning down. My neighbor, oh my, came, my neighbor went running out in her robe. Her her garage was burning. We thought the whole house was going. I, I wake up to flames, and we go running out. And like she was like she's like in her robe, and she looked at me. She's like, I've got nothing on under here. So again, think about this. You want to go to the hotel? With I don't even have a robe. <laughs> I, mean, I need to get a robe. That's my takeaway. I, I need a robe and some shoes under the bed. Yeah, there's oh just so many things that you've, got, you've got to have a plan. It, it, you this don't know is what's something going to else. You. People are networking here. This is great. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Do you have your robe? Do you have your shoes? Who's, Do you have your wallet? <laughs> what scaring, me to, scaring me to death. Make sure your homeowner's policy includes coverage for temp housing. Right. So that's, that's yes, Kelly, that's absolutely correct. So, so I want you all to do one thing tonight. Okay. Today, when we're done, I want you to all look at your insurance policy. Look under, it's called either additional living expenses or it's called um, loss of use. And make sure you read that and make sure you are covered. You should be covered at the minimum of 10% of the worth of your house. Okay. If you're not, you don't have enough coverage because if you're out of your home for 12 months, 24 months, I mean, here in Ventura, these people have been out of their house for 24 months because oh, they, gosh. you know, they, 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 we, there wasn't enough there were so many homes burnt that there wasn't enough contractors. And so you have to make sure that you have a good enough policy that's going to cover not just your temporary living, your furniture, um, the, the, the ALE is your temporary, temporary living, anything it takes to get you back on your feet, your uh, food. Everything. Are they paging you, Ben? No, nah, that's not me. I was going <laughs> to mute it until you asked me a question. Go ahead. What else should they cover? But anyway, so so the coverage, you have to make sure your coverage is there. It, it's so important and it's so sad if you don't have enough coverage. So, yeah, Kelly, thank you for bringing that up. You really need to check your coverage. Um, it's important. Check and, your coverage, get your bathroom, get your shoes, yep. throw your purses. Get your plan sounds ready. Like have, sounds like we have a top five already here. Oh, my goodness. Kelly, alternative inventory is key to having a comprehensive housing approach for clients. However, we must be selective and stringent for effective quality control, quality assurance. Yeah, you know, Brandy asked a question around quality, right? How do you manage the property quality in these so, kind of more alternative arrangements? Well, so there, so you do. You need to um, to really manage the the quality, and a lot of it is is you know working with any landlords that you're working with, making sure that you know you know the the, the life of video now, um, you know, videoing everything, going through everything um checklists you, you provide checklists quality checklists you know show me pictures of all of your sockets are your sockets okay are there no wires hanging out you know 
you're, you're just going through a whole, you, you have a whole checklist of things that must be completed before you're going to let somebody go out and look at a home. Um, you know, with the apartment communities, you can do a lot of background checks with, you also want to do background check on the um, landlords. You want to make sure that they're not in foreclosure. Could you imagine if they're in foreclosure? Um, oh. they, no, no. I mean, you know, that's just, it's happened. It's happened in the industry. People have been in foreclosure and then they got the, the pat, you know, the, the police knocking on their door, making them get out. So there's a lot of different quality checks that you have to do. So interesting. So interesting. I, I want to stay on yeah. this. I want to stay on this. I want to stay on this. Um, <laughs> Joe Partake, and now I know what my next swag is deluxe suites, robes. So <laughs> when people are standing in the street watching their house burn down, at least they have a lovely, a lovely robe and nowhere to go. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's not a joking though. matter. It is sad, but yeah, you're right. No, sorry. gee, sorry, it wasn't a joke. Joe, no, but it is, yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Robert's got a great question. What about Airbnb's corporate housing, temporary housing division? I, this was a big thing back in the day, a few years ago. There were some acquisitions and stuff. I mean, is, is does Airbnb still have a corporate housing division? Is that even a thing? I mean, I'm, I think it's called their business division. And I do know, yes, there's, there's still salespeople that I see at all the different industry events that are going out and um, working with corporations. Um, yeah, so yes, they do. The challenge that I, in a lot of the um, companies that I've spoken to and the universities that I've spoken to and things like that, one of the biggest things is the vetting. And I think that was Kelly maybe that was asking or Jill, somebody just asked about the vetting. It's mm -hmm. it's the vetting, it's the quality control. Yes, I know they've put their entire, you know, they've put in processes and procedures for vetting their homes, but but, I, but one of the pushbacks still I'm seeing is the vetting because with this with our industry, there's just so many things that you're looking at for quality control. And, um, you know, I mean, corporate apartments, you know, complete extreme of quality control. Homes, there are, you know, based on the kind of company you are. And, and Airbnb is a good company, so they're putting it in there. But for the employees, it's more of a safety issue because well you i mean don't there was just a major article there's just yeah there was that major article it was the cover story on uh in bloomberg i want to say it was just this really scathing story about about airbnb and i mean you know duty of care is, is such a huge topic, huge topic in global mobility i mean we're sending people all over the world right and you know we have a responsibility to ensure their reasonable safety we have right. a legal responsibility we do to, to ensure their their reasonable yeah. safety uh, and i mean to your point i mean it just doesn't seem like there's enough oversight in there. no so you have i mean you have to do it. I, I mean i worked for the company that i mean that they you know they were all about duty of care that they went and did background checks they got and it, and it was when i mean they it went extensive into the kind of checks that they did and it was even not so much just the buildings and the properties but the areas around um and they got alerts so, you know, there's just so many things that we as a as an industry have to be making sure that, you know, we're making sure that we put people somewhere. The area is nice. The area is safe. Just, you know, just don't put them somewhere just to say, hey, here you go. Now, an insurance housing is a little bit different. Yeah. It's really difficult to say to somebody, oh, my God, your neighborhood's not very safe. I mean, right. You can't yeah, really say I'm yeah, not going to yeah. put you in your own neighborhood. But you're you're in your own neighborhood. That's a great. Yeah. No, no, that's a great point. I want to I want to stay there because. Phil saying liability is a challenge and like, yeah, there's liability, but I even think beyond liability, like even if the transfer or signee doesn't sue the company because something happened, right. you're already so nervous when you relocate somewhere, especially if you're going to another country or even oh, yeah. another region of the U.S. where there's a lot of different cultures. A lot of people don't know this is like 13 or 20 different cultures within the United States alone. Right. 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 So you have someone moving from middle America, maybe they have a little, a little, maybe they're a little angsty about going to the coast or vice versa. Right. And you get there and then something happens in your temp accommodation that makes you feel unsafe. Um, that can really rattle you and shake you and really undermine the entire assignment. I mean, we talk about failed assignments all the time. You know, the number one kind of indicator for ROI that people look at in global mobility assignments is the success of the assignment. What does that mean? How long does the person stay on assignment? How likely are they to, to like either come back or, you know, continue with the company right. after the assignment's done and what is their productivity? You know, if this happens during the uh, the kind of um, 
pivotal moment of the first couple of months uh, in that new area and they don't feel safe. I mean, I just think about the, the 13 different times my wife and I have moved. Those wow. first couple of months are critical. And if something made critical. her feel unsafe, it would be a, it would be a wrap. We'd be going back to wherever we came from. <laughs> no, I mean, you absolutely must you know, do, do your due diligence, you know, talk to people, know people. And that's what's so great about the whole industry is that, you know, we have partners all across the country. I mean, all across the world. So, you know, I could call uh, Richard and say, Hey Richard, what's going on in your, you know, in, uh, I think you're in London, Richard, and if you're not, I apologize, but I mean, yeah, he is. He's, somebody, a, he's, right? he's in learn, learn, okay, that's learn, learn. But you can call and you can say, Hey, tell me about this area. Walk it, show me. You can have your own employees do that. You know, here's an interesting one. When I first went over to, um, Asia to open up the uh, corporate apartments uh, for um, Oakwood. They put me up in, in in an apartment, and the first thing I did was look at the stove. Well, not the first thing, but I went to go cook something. I looked at the stove and I went, "Oh my gosh, how do I use it?" And so now, and I didn't. I didn't know how to call somebody downstairs and have them come up and show me how to use the the, the stove. And it's just these little tiny things that like, you know, now when I put people places, you know, you think about it, okay, they're going, you know, to another foreign country. How do you turn on the stove? Or when somebody comes to our country, how do they, you know, how do they turn on the air conditioning? I mean, little teeny tiny things make such yeah. a difference. The washing machine. I mean, yeah, totally. Right. Oh, this is so, so interesting, Tony. I, I love the expertise. I love the the, the, the tons of knowledge, the, the history lesson about corporate housing and how it all started. I think it's really important to know where we've come from as an industry, if we're going to know where we're heading. The evolution and innovation that we saw back in the 80s uh, around this, I think, can sometimes inform us strategically on how we can further innovate today. So I just I really, really love the stories yeah. that you shared. Thank you. Yeah. And I love the comments. And I love the questions people asked. But let's get to a little inspiration, Tony. What do you say? Okay, let's do it. You got a top five today, Tony, for us? I do. I do have a top five for you. My, uh, yep, there you go. My most favorite quotes I've, I have posted or seen on LinkedIn. Okay. All I, right. I like it. I like, okay. I like quotes. I like LinkedIn. Yep. Let's do it. All What's right, number five? Number five. Oh goodness, I'm probably gonna need my glasses. It's right here. It's on the screen. Oh Cheater. thank God. You go. All right, you know I still need my I still need my glasses, everybody. Cheater, okay. Cheaters for the cheat. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here, this is one. This one's good. It's really important. Attitude. Attitude is a choice. Happiness is a choice. Optimism is a choice. Giving is a choice. Respect is a choice. Whatever choice you make makes you choose wisely. I just I love this one. It just think about it. Think about what you're choosing what you're choosing to represent of yourself and what you want. Think about it. I just, I saw and, this one. And it, it yeah. Just, right. I, I like this too. I like this too. And, and I think that it's an empowering quote because I think a lot of times we think things happen to us that make us sad or make us angry. Things make us angry. Let's even look at the words, right? When the truth is we allow ourselves or we choose to, or we make angry. us angry right or negative right and uh i think that's that's beautiful love it yep love that one love okay it, let's it. see all right number, number four, four. <laughs> okay this is on my facebook i mean this is on my linkedin wall background whatever it is be the change you want to see in the world so don't sit there and complain and you know whine and i've done that i'm not gonna lie i'm not miss woohoo perfect i wish i could say that but i'm not <laughs> if you if you don't want to do it change it be the change you want to see in the world. You want people to be positive. You want people to be happy. You want people to be nice. Be part of be part of the solution. Help yeah, and I think and I think we're so much more powerful than we know, right? If we smile, people smile at us. If we laugh, yep. people laugh at us. If we cry, people cry with us. Yeah. We don't realize that people will will react is the way that we act, and and if and if we're good, then people will be good, and we have such an. Uh, um, an ability to create these ripple effects right. in the world around us. So uh, this is beautiful as well. I love this one. This is great. Yep. All right. Number three. three. Okay. Again, you can tell like this past, especially in the past couple of years, I've just had a huge impact on my world and my life and as well as everybody else. So um, I, I take a lot of things to heart and this is really important to me. Just speak with honesty, think with sincerity and act with integrity. It's so easy to just, 
try and do it. I mean, just just say it and but be sincere. You know, act with integrity. Don't you know? Just just do it. That's all I can say. Just like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This is great. All right, number two. Okay, this is this is one. Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind always. Ah, you know what? I, I haven't met somebody yet that has, doesn't have their own battle going on in their life. Whether, I mean, you just don't know. You just don't know what battle somebody's having. And to judge somebody or look down at them or be, say something nasty when you don't even know the person behind you in the line, you know what? You know, their, their child may be sick or, you know what? They, they just got laid off or something. Just be kind. Right. Now this is this is really great. I mean, judging judging people is always wrong, and this right. is why right here. This is why, and I, I love it because I do. I mean, I I, I have to remind myself this. I, you know, there's somebody just recently who who irritated me uh, a few times. They did the same thing and just irritated me. And I'm just like, really, really. And then you come to find out that they're going through like massive challenges in their personal yeah. life and their family, right. and their whole world is like falling apart. And then they had a few little missteps or whatever, right? And you're just like, this is so inconsequent. And then you feel, and then I felt silly, right? And I was like, I can't believe I was, you know. Right, because you're like, why, why was I that way? No, I mean, exactly. And you, and you just don't know what somebody's going through. So yeah. think about it. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Great reminder. Number one. No risks, no story. So this is, this is my, on my screensaver, this is my get up, look at it. And, you know, I've always loved to do things, startups, things like that. Just go for it. Go, go, go. And, you know, for a little while there, I was kind of down on myself and just, you know, I was, I was down on myself. That's it. I was just, gosh, am I, you know, I know so much, but I feel like I'm not doing what I need to do in this world. And, and, you know, I've been talking to friends that have just been amazing, encouraging me. And, you know, that's kind of where I've been kind of now, you know, doing my thing with, with, um, you know, hopefully uh, the whole thing with my um, Andel consulting and, and helping people within the industry and things like that. Let's, let's talk about Andel no real quick, real no quick. Risk. Let's plug, let's plug yeah. Andel consulting. So tell people what, what they can get with Andel consulting and, and what you're there to help with. Well, I would, I'm here with a few things. I'm here to, you know, help companies that are looking for, you know, strategies on whether it's their sales team their business plans uh, with working with the corporations, um, some of the technology platforms. I've worked with different technology platforms, um, insurance housing, helping people understand insurance housing. I actually had a company, interestingly enough, come to me and say, hey, can you help actually put down a business plan together or a, a, prepare, a disaster preparedness plan for me to share with my employees so that they're ready beforehand so that I can help talk to them, you know, before and after disaster, you know, kind of teach us a, how to handle disasters um, when it affects our employees. I'm also actually working with some of the different uh, universities and different companies on helping, um, you know, figure out what companies and what are the best solutions for them for housing and accommodations. So I'm, I'm doing that as well. Yeah, so Beautiful. I'm excited. How can, I, I'm and how excited. can people get in touch with you, Tony, so they can hire Endel Consulting and change their business for well, the, for the good. Well, you can message me on LinkedIn. You can call me 805-406-0866 and email me at tonyandel at gmail.com. Beautiful. Tony, this was great. I love talking to you today. I feel pumped up. I got my five amazing quotes. I got some great history. I got some great strategy. I got some great trends. This is great. All the people that were tuning in here, this is fantastic. Lynn says, Tony, you're the best and fabulous resource with a heart of gold. Thank Everybody you. else was loving this show here. Jack had a great question. Jack, we didn't get to your question. I feel terrible. Should we do Jack's? We should do Jack's yeah. question. We're going to do Jack's question. Jack, love you, man. Jack says, is there a consistent measurement or standard that is used for duty of care to evaluate various corporate housing buildings? Um, you know what there I, I would say across the, the the industry that there is a very consistent measurement on um, duty of care that you know I mean that most of the companies that work together and I know I know Chippa even has a whole list a whole um, basically a focus on this particular standard within the industry so yes there is pretty much a consistent measurement yes each yeah. different companies do different things but 
I will tell you what, the corporate housing industry has it together on making sure of, of yeah. looking at duty of care. Jack, I would highly suggest per capita murders. Per capita murders. That's what I would use, Jack. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just joke, 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 joke. Kidding, kidding aside, kidding aside. Um, this was a great show. Thank you both. Elena, thanks for the wisdom you shared today. Tony, Thank you. awesome. This is great. Tony, thanks again for being oh, here. Thanks. Fun. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody that tuned in. Thanks for all the questions, the comments. You were wonderful. I